Unemployed in the Hashemite Kingdom, Jordan largely dodged the Arab Spring, but with growing anger over the faltering economy, will young people stay silent? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Jordan's jobless youth. Have you ever wondered what keeps a king up at night? Well, for Jordan's King Abdullah, it's the economy, and it's little wonder why. Jordan's youth unemployment is sky high. The budget is around a billion dollars in the red, and the country is increasingly relying on foreign aid. The IMF recently loaned Jordan $700 million, but as they did in Greece, they're demanding austerity measures in return. And when some of those were introduced earlier this year, it brought people onto the streets. Jordan's monarchy survived the Arab Spring that toppled leaders across the region, helped in part by the king's apparent willingness to reform. But the root problems haven't gone away. Is there a risk that around the corner lies a different kind of Jordanian spring? I'll be speaking with a government official in a minute, but first, here is Yvette McCullough with the second installment in our special coverage from Jordan. One of the jewels of the Middle East, the Hashemite Kingdom is praised for its political stability. But under the weight of a stagnant economy, the drain on finances by regional conflicts and fresh austerity measures, this jewel could be at risk of cracking. We have to address these issues. We have to empower young people and allow them to get more jobs. Uh, without that, uh, we will have tougher times to, 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 to face up to in the future. In February, hundreds of Jordanians came out to protest a hike in fuel prices and taxes on commodities. Many calling for the cabinet to resign. The new austerity measures are part of a deal with the International Monetary Fund to grant much needed loans of 723 million over three years in exchange for Jordan reducing its budget deficit. But it's Jordan's already struggling poor and middle class who fear the effects of these new austerity measures the most. I don't think that it will work, and I think it probably may even aggravate the situation further. We have to be growth oriented, otherwise, uh, you know, we will just continue to grapple with the same problems over and over every year at a bigger scale. Jordan's capital, Amman, is the most expensive city in the Arab world, but its wages are among the lowest. A recent study by the Phoenix Centre found that 58% of Jordanians feel pessimistic about the economy. Unemployment is high at 15%, and for young people, the rate is more than double that. When the winds of change swept across North Africa and the Middle East, thousands of Jordanians protested against their poor economic prospects and political system. Unlike many of its neighbours, Jordan's unrest during the Arab Spring ended in reform, not a bloody or failed revolution. But fast forward to today, and some of that same dissatisfaction still runs deep. And for young Jordanians, the hopes of graduating university and fulfilling their dreams are fading. 24-year-old engineer Marwan Badwin graduated last year. He's wanted to be an engineer since he was young. After months of struggling to find employment, he settled for an average paying job at a local university. A familiar scenario for many engineers in the region. In the last two years, the war in Yemen uh, by Saudi Arabia affected us the most. Uh, most of Jordan projects are sponsored by the, uh, the Saudi Arabia government and since the war has started and the new Saudi king with the new policies, uh, everything got a bit worse than before. Marwan says that like him, many of his friends are struggling. They can't find a job, no matter how they look. Like I've seen my friends like that, the dreams start to break down, to break down until like he could accept anything with a, with a desperate life. This is what they become. If things don't start to turn around soon, Marwan says he can't see himself having a future here. Some see political reform as the only way forward for Jordan, 
moving to a system where the government is appointed by the elected parliament, not the king. I think that if there isn't a political breakthrough and the economic crisis worsens, there will be a danger that threatens Jordan and the region. What happened in Syria, what happened in Iraq, in Libya, Yemen, this is a deep lesson for all of us, because protest couldn't find an alternative. It led to a situation worse than before. With limited opportunities, there's fears that Jordan's youth will feel increasingly alienated and marginalised. Feelings that made up the recipe for the Arab Spring. Yvette McCullough and Imam for the Newsmakers. So what's to blame for Jordan's economic woes and what can be done about it? Is it a question of exports? Are foreign companies wary of investing? Well, to try and answer those questions, I'm joined now from Amman by Jordan's Minister of Industry, Trade and Supply, Yarub Kuda. Well, let's, if I can, start with, unfortunately, some of the more critical reports about uh, your economy. Some saying unequivocally that Jordan is actually headed toward insolvency, that the country has become too dependent on foreign aid and austerity measures are only punishing the country's poor and middle class people. Is that the case? Is it that bad? Um, actually, it's, it's the way around by all means. Uh, you know that the challenges that we have faced mainly due to the instability in our region and with the uh, refugees crisis that surrounding Jordan uh, has raised the huge challenges by all means on our economy. But on the other side, we in Jordan, we always believe in changing opportunities to uh, uh, challenges to opportunities by all uh, means. Um, I do agree with you at a level of time that there are some economical indicators that were below our expectations. But taking into consideration with all the challenges that is in, that's happening in the region and getting an economical growth of around 2.3% for last year and the targeted growth by the international community actually and international organizations saying that it will reach up to 3%, even with the challenge that we are facing, is, is by all means a, a, a great uh, success for the economy. Uh, even with the exports, with the highly limitations and the blocked, blocks of borders uh, to the northern borders of Jordan with Syria, to the eastern borders with Iraq, and even though uh, all the drop in exports that we're talking about is, is less than 8%. So it's by itself, it means that the Jordanian economy is very dynamic and very able to overcome the different challenges that have, have been facing over the last uh, four uh, years. On the other side, by having more than 1.7 million Syrian refugees in our, in our uh, country, with another million refugees uh, from different nationalities, uh, that contributes around 30% or 35% of our population by, by, by all means is creating a, a, a challenge uh, by, uh, by, by itself. Indeed. On the other side, the country, or, uh, the country by itself, when we're talking about uh, the GDP growth, when we're talking about the export diversification at the same time to, to non-traditional markets that being able to pick up exports is by, by, by itself uh, uh, clear that the Jordanian economy is a very strong one and is growing uh, according to uh, expectations. Okay, but you are aware that many Jordanians, some of whom have actually taken to the streets, we've seen some pictures on our screen there, complain that they are being asked to dig deeper into their pockets and if that more were done to tackle corruption, they wouldn't have to be struggling. Sure. Um, just to, to make it very clear, I mean, as a country, we're taking a strategic uh, uh, direction and strategic decision towards the resilience of our uh, economy. You have just mentioned in, in your report or in your statement that we depend heavily in the past on the foreign aid. And we believe now it's about time to start building our economy on a very solid base, regardless of the foreign aid that's coming from uh, uh, different uh, countries and different uh, uh, international uh, uh, organizations. And accordingly, we have taken a financial reform that we believe it will put the Jordanian economy on the track that it will be uh, 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 as expected within the coming uh, five uh, years. I do agree with you that the challenge of the debt to equity ratio is higher than uh, expected. On the other side, this is why we had to take uh, uh, some actions toward the uh, resilience and the growth of our uh, uh, economy. But in those actions, actually, one of the most important aspects to focus on is mainly that it didn't touch 
the mid-low uh, level income uh, uh, segments of, of, of uh, uh, the population. Most of, as an example, uh, uh, food uh, products were not affected by any way with the increase of, of uh, taxes in specific. And at the same time, we were going uh, into more liberalized economy in order to attract more foreign direct investments and to create a more conducive business uh, environment by the different legislations that I would like to talk more about, if you don't mind, in, uh, within our uh, interview. Okay. Now, saying that, saying that, that we're going deeper into the pockets of our uh, citizens, uh, uh, I would say uh, 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 if you're saying that uh, uh, the mid-low income population were not affected either by income tax, either by sales tax, most of the commodities that are being used by such uh, 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 segments have not been affected, I would say that uh, uh, it's the way around that we try to protect that uh, uh, segment as much as we can. Uh, 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 the income tax law, you, you need to know that 92% of the Jordanian population are not paying income tax. As an example, 80% uh, of the okay. food commodities were not affected by any increase of taxes. There definitely are some strengths in the economy. We accept that, and I'm glad you're optimistic, but I'd like to read a statement from King Abdullah himself. He said recently, there is a lot of unemployment, and that could lead to radicalization. That is what has kept me up for the past five or six years. The economy, not the politics or the military or security situation. I am trying to grow the economy and look after my people. Do you share his concerns? Or do you think the situation is of better course. than he's letting on in oh. that statement? Uh, of course I do share his statement, by all means. When it comes to the unemployment, I would say clearly that the unemployment rate for last year was 16 percent. And there's many reasons, actually. There are many reasons behind uh, such a high unemployment. First one is, is receiving in three years more than 1.7 million Syrian refugees. They were welcomed in Jordan. Uh, uh, they were not even under any uh, uh, blocks, by all means. They were open to go and to start adding value to themselves and to their families in the local market. So they, they went into competition with the Jordanians with uh, a limited jobs opportunity created over the last three years because of the challenges in the region. Uh, that unemployment rate is, is a strategic issue that the government is working on uh, finding solutions. We believe that the economy is by all means is the stability of, of Jordan, is the main factor of the stability of, of Jordan. And this is where we need to think of how and, uh, and we are already working on enhancing the, the economy, either on the business uh, environment in itself or on the legislation and the le le laws and regulations that are uh, 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 harming the, the business environment, either or uh, on enhancing our exports through non-traditional markets. We're thinking of diversifying both the export products and the export markets at the same uh, uh, time. We have a package of, of regulations that have been approved by the government and the, by the parliament. Many of them is like the insolvency law, where it will uh, help more the entrepreneurship, the startups uh, uh, and creativity, the non-movable assets uh, uh, law and the inspection law, where it will not create any overlapping between the different institutions. We have a package of incentives that we are providing to the foreign direct investors. Jordan, by all means now, clearly is becoming a hub for the, for the region. We're talking about the rebuilding of Iraq, rebuilding of Syria in the coming future, where Jordan is the only country has a common border with both uh, countries, okay. which indicates clearly that there is, a, 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 there is optimistic by all means, but there is work on the ground in order to reach a level where the uh, economy is growing uh, according to expectation, hopefully even higher than the expectations, and towards creating a real business environment that would, would create a, a new jobs uh, opportunities and higher added value jobs that would attract Jordanian to work in. Okay, I, I'd like to give our audience, if we can, a better picture quickly of what the Jordanian economy actually consists of in terms of exports. Uh, we have a quick graphic here, and you can see that uh, fertilizers, planes, helicopters, yeah. and spacecraft produced in Jordan, calcium phosphates, sweaters, textile industry, and unpackaged uh, medicines are actually uh, your top six products. Where do you envision, then, uh, your real growth industries among those that are succeeding for Jordan already? 
Sure. Uh, yani when we talk about the industry, we talk about the exports of, of, of products. Uh, because I would like also to emphasize the importance of the exports of services at the same uh, time. We believe we are a very uh, dynamic, diversified economy as a Jordan. The industrial sector or the manufacturing sector is, is one of the most important sectors that we, uh, contributes to the economy. It contributes around 22% uh, of the uh, GDP. And in that regard, we're trying to make sure that most of the industry that we have is a higher added value, which means that it has a higher impact on the economy, and at the same time, it has a higher competitiveness uh, uh, edge uh, 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 at the same time. Part of that is the pharmaceutical industry in Jordan. Jordan is becoming now the hub for the uh, Arab world and for the region when it comes to the exports of pharmaceutical. We're exporting more than $500 million yearly of pharmaceutical uh, products. Many of the success stories in that regard were achieved by all means. We could say that even in the pharmaceutical industry, we'll start expanding out of Jordan by establishing manufacturing uh, facilities in Europe, in the United States, in, and in the Arab uh, world. Fertilizers, you know that we have a huge amount of potash and phosphate in Jordan, and we're exporting a lot of that uh, raw material, but the plan is to go to the downstream industries by producing fertilizers and other products that are coming from the uh, raw materials, where it will create more jobs and it will enhance the uh, export uh, uh, balance of, of uh, Jordan. Yarab Kuda, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we're out of time on The Newsmakers. Thank you. Venezuela's crisis is deepening as food shortages worsen and anti-government protests rage on. But President Maduro remains defiant, threatening to dismiss the National Assembly with a draft constitution. The U.S. has accused Maduro of an illegal power grab, prompting new threats of sanctions. But the relationship wasn't always so strained, mainly due to the importance of oil. Venezuela is a major crude oil exporter. Its biggest customer? The United States. Venezuela's state-run oil company, PDVSA, even has a U.S. subsidiary, Citgo Petrol, which owns several pipelines and refineries in America. But Citgo came under fire after it made a $500,000 donation to President Trump's inauguration, dwarfing those made by giants like Pepsi and Walmart. But days before the Citgo donation, Russian state oil company Rosneft gave Venezuela's PDVSA a $1.5 billion loan. In return, PDVSA offered Rosneft a 50% stake in Citgo. That stake could end up in Russia's hands if Venezuela defaults on its debts. One U.S. senator warned this could leave Rosneft, a Russian company controlled by oligarchs with close ties to Vladimir Putin, in control of critical energy infrastructure in the United States. Currently, though, Rosneft wouldn't be able to claim that stake because the company is under U.S. sanctions for Russia's actions in Ukraine. There are signs President Trump is tightening pressure on Maduro's government. But could Trump's ties to Citgo come back to haunt him as he tries to craft U.S. policy towards Venezuela? Still to come on the newsmakers, there are no tanks or airstrikes, but it is the deadliest conflict outside of Syria. Can anything stop Mexico's drug cartels? And we ask why FIFA decided it no longer needs its ethics police. Welcome back to the Newsmakers. More people were killed last year in the fight against Mexico's drug gangs than in wars in Yemen and Afghanistan combined. And if you exclude Syria, Mexico's drug war is killing people faster than any other conflict in the world, with one death every 23 minutes. With U.S. drug sales fueling the trade, critics say the current policies on both sides of the border have failed. Shoaib Hassan reports. He had said, let them kill us all, after a reporter covering Mexico's drug war was murdered earlier this year. And now award-winning journalist Javier Waldes is also dead, gunned down on the street. He's the latest casualty in what the International Institute for Strategic Studies says is the second deadliest conflict in the world. The International Institute for Strategic Studies research report says 
23,000 people were killed in Mexico in 2016. That's a 72% increase from 2015, when 16,700 were killed. Out of every 10 homicides there, 7 are carried out by drug cartels. The cartels are financed by drug sales to the US, estimated to average $24 billion annually. The largest and deadliest is the Sinaloa cartel, named after the Mexican state where it's based. That's also the state with the highest murder rate. Critics accuse Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto of failing to strengthen security there and across the country. That may be due to endemic corruption and fear of retaliation by the cartels. And recent moves by the newly elected US leadership may prove detrimental in the long fight against drugs. Going forward, I have empowered our prosecutors to charge and pursue the most serious offense, as I believe the law requires, uh, most uh, serious, readily provable offense. Experts say the U.S. Attorney General's decision means first-time drug offenders arrested for non-violent crimes will face the same sentence as hardcore drug cartel members. They point to research that such laws push first-time offenders towards a life of criminality and will fuel the violence such as the recent spike in drug cartel-related killings. And more money means greater power for the cartels in Mexico as they butcher their way to more control. Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, to further discuss the war on drugs, I'm joined now by David Shirk. He is the director of justice in Mexico and an associate professor of political science and international relations at the University of San Diego. From Oaxaca, Mexico, Laura Carlson. She is the director of the Americas program at the Center for International Policy. And in London, Mike Trace. He has decades of experience in drug policy with various international agencies, including the United Nations, the EU, and he is formerly, was formerly the chair of the International Drug Policy Consortium. Thanks all so much for joining us. Let's begin then with a look at this report from the uh, International Institute for Strategic Stud Studies, as there seems to be some disagreement uh, on its veracity. Laura Carlson, you believe the reality is as bad as this report says, correct? Absolutely, we see this from here in Mexico. The report calls Mexico an armed conflict, and that's the major point that the Mexican government has contended. But the criteria of territorial control by armed groups, a threat to the state that's sustained, and the deployment of armed forces are clearly complied with in the case of Mexico. Moreover, the number of deaths, even though the Mexican government contests that this is the total number of homicides and not just related to the drug war itself, even if you took out a base level of homicides for other reasons, and of course the report, what they say is, we know that, but the Mexican government isn't giving out statistics for just drug war related homicides, so we're forced to use this number. But even if you calculated a baseline, you still have this huge number that's fairly clearly attributed to the drug war. And we know this because, as it mentions, in a non conventional warfare, this is not indiscriminate killings by bombings of civilians. But the majority of these killings are selective and they're actually execution-style murders. Okay, David Shirk, uh, you feel those numbers are exaggerated, actually. Go ahead. I think Laura is incorrect in stating that the majority of the 23,000 homicides last year were execution style committed by multiple groups. There are actually some really good estimates that come out of various sources, non-governmental sources, which indicate the proportion of organized crime style killings uh, that we see in Mexico. And the best estimates that we see top that number out at about 10 or 12,000 last year. So perhaps at, at most, Half of the homicides that we saw last year in Mexico were organized crime style. But a, a larger point here is that even if you took all 23,000 homicides in Mexico and said that they were caused by organized crime, that's half the number 
of homicides we saw in Brazil last year, where many of the same conditions exist. Uh, and so if you were looking for the greatest conflict, uh, in, uh, the, certainly in the Americas, you would point to Brazil. So this report singles out Mexico, uh, perhaps for very good reasons. Certainly we've seen an, a militarization of the conflict. Uh, certainly the Mexican government has not done a very good job in dealing with drug trafficking organizations. But the base facts that are used uh, in this report are not facts. Laura, let, I'll let you respond. Well, they certainly are facts. I mean, the number of homicides comes directly from the government figures. As, as everyone has admitted, being able to separate those from regular homicides is very difficult. But if you look at the graph of how homicides have increased as a result of this drug war model, it's very clear the effect of the drug war in this huge number of homicides. And if you look like at baseline numbers of homicides, for example, around the 8,000 mark before the drug war began, then it's clear that this is related. There's also a blurry line between what is a drug war related homicide and not. First of all, there are no investigations. Very seldom are there investigations. It's a nation that's known for its impunity and for a dysfunctional justice system, so we can't know that. And secondly, there are a number of homicides that are related to the spread of arms that have happened within the context of the drug war. Why is this important to try to get these numbers together and, and define Mexico as, as an armed conflict? It's important because much of this armed conflict in Mexico is a direct result of state policy. And that is at the end of 2006 when the drug war is imposed and there's this decision to, to fight drug cartels in a military manner is when we see this explosion of violence. And until we recognize this and until the international community recognizes it, state policies are involved in the violence here, we will not be able to communicate the gravity of the situation and begin to look for other solutions that can lead us toward peace instead of this spiraling violence. Okay, Mike Trace, I'm going to let you jump in there because you also seem to think the uh, war on drugs is being fought from the wrong angle. And I think the exchange you just heard shows how hard it is to uh, interpret what's actually happening on the ground. But I think we can all agree that these figures and this trend is very dif disappointing for the Peña Nieto government, uh, which has given some good uh, policy leadership when they came into power, certainly some leadership at the United Nations to say that the level of violence in Mexico and many other countries related to drug markets was unacceptable, and we had to try significantly different strategies to bring that violence down. As I say, President Peña Nieto has given some good international leadership on that issue, but it, these figures show that they're on the ground, the policies are not being implemented and the improvements are not being seen within Mexico. So a real dilemma here. But what about, I mean, what Laura was saying about how this so-called war on drugs is actually being fought. David Shirk, I'll, I'll let you comment on this. Is this somewhat military approach to fighting cartels the best strategy out there? Uh, everyone, I think, in this conversation agrees that it is not the best strategy. But distorting the facts uh, and trying to characterize all homicides in Mexico or the vast majority of homicides in Mexico as drug-related is a flawed strategy in itself. Uh, Laura completely ignored my point about Brazil, uh, which ag again has twice as many homicides, many of the same conditions. Why aren't we pointing the finger at Brazil? Uh, we've spent, our organization, Justice in Mexico, has spent the last decade tracking these homicides and trying to call attention uh, to drug-related homicides for the, exactly the same reason that Laura has. Uh, but I think this report uh, uses a very sensationalistic strategy, one that is loose at best with the facts, uh, and it does so simply to gain attention. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate because, it, number one, uh, if the conditions are bad enough in Mexico and, and they speak for themselves, uh, so we don't need to distort them. And number two, uh, distorting those facts, I think, does a disservice to the many other conflicts around the world, armed conflicts, uh, where citizens are fighting against their government for political reasons. Uh, I think it does a disservice to the many other people who are dying around the world in the name of freedom. Okay, Mike, let me ask you, because there is a point, a very important point here that this uh, report doesn't highlight quite as strongly, um, and that is that without consumers, without customers, there is no market, period, 
So in large part, it is wealthy yeah. U.S. citizens and European consumers that are actually empowering these drug cartels, particularly in the cocaine trade. So let me ask you why you think more effort isn't being made to expose and penalize those, those privilege, privileged customers who use cocaine recreationally and continue to drive this trade and its lucrative ends? Uh, well, there's no doubt that demand drives the profits that the uh, cartels are fighting over. And the biggest demand, the biggest profits are to be made in the lucrative Western markets. That, that uh, global balance is changing somewhat in recent years, but it's still the case that for Mexican traffickers, uh, U.S. demand is their biggest uh, market. Um, of course, a lot has been tried by the U.S. government and local authorities and uh, same across the world to reduce demand and to create the conditions where the market is stifled. Um, these uh, uh, strategies have not managed to reduce demand massively. There are upticks and downticks. But basically, in, a, in an illegal market uh, that's uh, not regulated, then there is always going to be uh, a large amount of profit to be made by the most violent and the most ruthless. And that's the set of conditions we have in Mexico and across Latin America at the moment. As I've said, there are some good policy initiatives in Mexico and elsewhere to try and change these realities. But uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, the results in Mexico at the moment are yet to bear fruit. And on the point of uh, uh, a war on drugs, or what might be called a war on drugs, or escalating state conflict, we do now have pretty good evidence over decades now that any time that a military approach is taken to take on the cartels, the violence upticks. And Mexico experienced that uh, through the last 10 years, and uh, we've seen that in other countries as well. So there is a real dilemma here. I don't think you can easily uh, stifle the market, the demand for the market. Uh, U.S. authorities are trying to do that. Uh, and you can't easily defeat the cartels. That, that sends a... That's a very nice uh, political soundbite, but you can't uh, create the situation where the profit isn't there and the power of organized crime isn't there. So we do have to find new ways of responding to this problem because uh, Mexico, like many countries, is finding that the nature and the cycle of violence continues whether you crack down or whether you tolerate. Laura, I'll let you jump in there. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I wanted to respond to the point about Brazil. I wrote the International Institute for Strategic Studies, sent them the response of the Mexican government, and they came back. And they said Brazil and Venezuela, countries that do have higher homicide rates, are not included in this study for the reasons that we do not consider them armed conflicts because of the criteria I mentioned before. That's why Mexico is there and other countries are not. This is a very important distinction and one of the contributions of this study. By seeing Mexico as not just dispersed criminality, but as an armed conflict, we have to go to the roots of what's going on here. And that's why continuing to do the same thing and go up against different cartels in the various places where violence explodes is going to create more violence, as we've seen, despite a slight tendency downward, now we've got a peak upward, which goes to show that there's been no structural improvement in fighting this so-called war on drugs, and brings us back to the point that the strategy is causing the violence. And that's why I think it's a positive thing to call attention to this violence. As someone who lives here, as a human rights defender and a journalist, two categories, that have been particularly targeted in this violence, you know, there's a desperation for the international community to respond to what's going on and to convince both the Mexican and the U.S. governments that there's urgent need to change strategies and demilitarize this conflict immediately. Okay. David, let me ask you on strategy. When these harsher penalties are introduced for drug crimes, as we've just seen Attorney General Jeff Sessions do in the United States, um, the people most likely to end up in jail are often the poorest users, and they end up kind of further burdening a system that's already completely overwhelmed. Um, it didn't seem to work under Reagan, yet we're seeing it repeated now under Sessions. Do you think it will be any different this time? No, I, I think that what we will see as a result of harsher penalties uh, for drug offenses is uh, more people needlessly going to jail uh, for a 
what is effectively a public health problem. Uh, as Michael pointed out in his comments, uh, there are much better ways to tackle uh, the, the problem of drug use in our societies. And uh, I think all three of us uh, probably agree on that idea. Um, the, uh, the, the, the challenge is that throughout the United States and throughout this hemisphere, uh, unfortunately, the costs of our policies are being borne by uh, many of the people at the bottom rungs of society. Um, and whether we're talking about Mexico or Brazil, where the drug war is very actively being fought, uh, including tanks and, and including uh, major organized crime groups like we see in Mexico, um, you're seeing uh, the poorest of the poor uh, being dragged into this. And, and basically because in many cases they have no other options. They don't have educational uh, opportunities and they don't have job opportunities. And so their best opportunity is found in the black market. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if we uh, try to lock people up uh, as the solution to this, there will always be another person uh, to take their place uh, who is uh, in need of educational or employment opportunities. Okay. Uh, and so the, that's, I think we all right. agree on that. Um, Mike, let me wrap up with you then. What are these better ways? What are the strategies that are being missed here to fight and potentially even win the war on drugs? Uh, one on demand reduction, one on supply reduction. First of all, agree with David entirely what uh, Jeff Sessions is playing with in the U.S., which is uh, increasing penalties again. It's been tried many times by the U.S. and others. Whatever you think about the harshness or, uh, or otherwise of those policies, they don't work. They don't reduce demand. So the objective will not be met, and a lot of people will be harmed along the way. On supply side, the objective has to be very focused on what does it take to undermine the power of the organized crime cartels that are profiting from this illegal trade. Some posit that you can do that by creating a regulated market, which is happening with cannabis now. Some posit you can do that by creating your law enforcement strategies that tolerate some sorts of distribution of uh, illegal drugs and uh, clamp down on others. Uh, it's called smart enforcement. Uh, so smart enforcement strategies on the supply side and uh, uh, more tolerant strategies on the demand side, and we'll start getting to grips with this policy in a much less, uh, in a way that creates much less violence. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. I'd like to thank all three of you so much for joining us. Laura Carlson there from Oaxaca, Mexico, David Shirk in San Diego, and Mike Trace in London. Thanks for being on The Newsmakers. For what emerged from the First World War was an artificial structure which ever since then has been the source of huge anger, rejection, frustration in the Middle East. A sign of the difficult times through which Palestine is passing is the presence at Haifa of the Repulse. The movements of British warships often supply an index to political unrest, and the continuance of the Jewish-Arab conflict has brought this capital ship to the port to assist in keeping order. Meanwhile, there is virtually a state of war. Witness this scene on the Syrian border where volunteers organized by the British command are erecting an elaborate barbed wire barricade. The difficulties involved in preserving peace are enormous and it seems that defensive measures on a large scale and constant vigilance on the part of patrols are the only methods. Flashes, raids and bombings continue with alarming frequency, so the countryside is protected with barbed wire entanglements. Suddenly people throughout the Middle East and in the center of Europe found themselves living in a world where they didn't know what country they belonged to, it wasn't quite clear what the borders of those countries would be, a whole lot of small wars were breaking out between different national movements trying to grab territory. And so it was, in fact, a very, very difficult time for people. The removal of the Essex Committee is not in FIFA's best interest, it's against good governance. And it's a setback 
for the fight against corruption. The governing body of world football doesn't exactly have the best reputation for being accountable and transparent. So you can imagine the shock when FIFA announced it was removing the people running its ethics committee. The sacked judge and prosecutor led investigations that brought down disgraced former president Sepp Blatter and other top officials. Now, both men have called the decision to remove them political, saying FIFA boss Gianni Infantino clearly doesn't want corruption investigated too deeply. FIFA says it's simply replacing them with candidates better suited to the role. And critics of the committee say corruption had been rife under their leadership for years, and they were only recently pursuing dodgy officials. So what was behind the decision? Were they probing too many inconvenient truths? Well, to discuss that, I'm joined now from Zurich by Jamie Fuller. He is the co-founder of the campaign group calling for New FIFA Now and veteran sports commentator and public relations advisor, Klaus Stolker. Thanks both so much uh, for joining us. I think it's safe to say that uh, FIFA firing its ethics committee looks about as good as Donald Trump uh, firing his FBI director. So, Jamie, let me start with you. Why did they do it? Uh, look, as you said in your introduction there, Andrea, transparency and accountability aren't exactly very high on the top of the list of priorities for Mr. Infantino or what he would have us believe is a new reformed FIFA. Uh, I think he's taken a leaf out of Donald Trump's book. I think it's interesting to hear Mr. Infantino last week again talking about fake news as well. So the only conclusion that we can draw is that he's done it because he wants to stifle ethics investigations and he wants to stifle the reform of FIFA. I can't draw any other conclusion. But having said that, I must say, the departure of uh, Mrs. Eckert and Borbley isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I take issue with the way that it's been done. Klaus, did it make you suspicious? Uh, I think nobody is defending corruption at FIFA. But I can tell you that I'm very, very lucky that Infantino was able to kill that monster. FIFA had become hostage of that ethics group, especially of Mr. Barbelli and Mr. Eckert. And Sepp Blatter, I'm sorry to say this, my old client, was not able to do this. So F Infantino did what Blatter missed. And it's better for FIFA and it's better for football. Okay. Do you, do you feel then that Gianni Infantino, Klaus, is the best man to be leading FIFA right now? At this moment, Gianni Infantino is the best man and he is trusted by all the teams and he has to prepare the games in Moscow. He has to prepare many other things. So he doesn't need that pain in the neck of a second government, which is called Ethics Committee. Now I hope and I think that this Ethics Committee knows what it has to do. It's not a second government of FIFA. It's an ethics committee which cares for ethics and not for the whole government. Jamie, I'll let you jump in. Yeah, I think uh, I take issue with a couple of things that Klaus has said there. Um, the way Klaus describes it, it's almost like he was saying that in the, the Blatter era, the ethics committee was a finely tuned, well-oiled running machine. Uh, the harsh reality, as far as Mrs. Eckert and Borbley is concerned, is it's taken the intervention of the FBI and the Swiss federal prosecutors for them to get off their backsides and do some jobs. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's impossible to defend the lack of action, the inertia of the Ethics Committee under Mr. Blatter. Uh, but like I said before, um, having, having said that, there's a proper process that one should go through for a transition like this. Uh, Mr. Infantino has disregarded that completely. Uh, he will have pushed back, he'll put back the whole progress of ethics investigations by years with the way that they've done this. Uh, and I think both of the gentlemen deserve to have a, a greater opportunity to have had a smooth transition without it being an instant guillotine. Go ahead, Klaus. I'll let you respond to that before I move on. That that is not at all true. The American intervention of the Clinton government was a pure political intervention. And now with the Trump government, I think the whole case is finished. And I'm very glad about this. You see, I'm not against ethics committee. It's really important. 
Platter was not against ethics committee. He invented it. He introduced it. And Infantino is not against ethics committee. But we, we are against Swiss lawyers or German lawyers like Bobley and Eckert, who are really overstating their wonderful paid position. Jamie, let me ask you then, if it's not yeah, Gianni... It's, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Andrea. Yeah, sorry, look, Andrea, I think no one could argue that the Ethics Committee was effective under Mr Blatter. And what Mr Blatter had was an Ethics Committee that basically did his bidding. And so where he wanted things looked at, they were looked at, and where he didn't, they didn't. The Ethics Committee wasn't independent. Uh, Mark Peat, you could only speak to the, um, the, the Swiss lawyer Mark Peat, who held a senior role on the, on the Ethics Committee, he chaired the Ethics Committee, and he'll tell you the lack of the lack of progress, the constant inertia, and the interference uh, from FIFA and the, particularly the executive committee. I mean, there's no it's no no coincidence that we've seen so many members of the FIFA executive committee wiped out as a result of. And I agree with with Klaus the the interference of the Americans. But what do we expect when when FIFA is just continually feeding and driving this culture of corruption, which has been going on for decades? for decades to back to Mr Blatter's predecessor. I mean, what do you expect? So whilst it's not the perfect outcome to have the Americans step in the way they did it, frankly, thank God they did. At least somebody was trying to do something and make some change happen. And Klaus, I was going to move on, but seeing you roll your eyes like that, I need to find let out me, what uh, you're thinking. Let, <laughs> yes, let me be precise. Mark Peart, the professor from Basel, what really, was really a big disgrace for the whole of FIFA. He was the man who consulted Sepp Blatter to start with the Ethics Committee. But Blatter never thought, never thought that this Ethics Committee would grow and grow and grow and overstate its position. And so that's why everybody in global football has to be happy what's done now. We need a realistic ethics committee, an ethics committee which is fit to control and which is fit to act, but not a killer insight inside the FIFA organization. I think that's not possible and I'm glad that Infantino killed it. Okay, if we can. And, I evidently, do an ethics committee, and evidently an ethics committee that's not independent either, which is where I think Klaus and I have a big disagreement. Independence Independence means responsibility, and the responsibility was not given by the old government of the Ethics Committee. Okay, if we can, I'd like to move on no, and talk... I'm sorry, Klaus. I think independence <laughs> means... Okay. Sorry, Andrea. I'll, <laughs> I'll be quiet. I'll shut up. No, don't worry. I, I just wish we had more time, because I, I want to get a couple minutes in for something, Jamie, that you've written pretty extensively about, and it's not just about what goes on inside FIFA, the accountability, the transparency. It's the chain of command that trickles right down to the people building FIFA facilities. Right now in Qatar for the 2022 World Cup, Jamie, you've written a lot about the proof that we've seen of, at best, exploited labor, at worst, forced, some even call it slave labor. What is FIFA doing now? Because it would be, to their credit, if we would see them address these issues, but Jamie, you said they haven't addressed it at all, to make FIFA and sponsors accountable for the exploitation of labor going into the Qatar World Cup, World Cup in 2022. Yeah, Andrea, FIFA uh, engaged in purely a sp an, episode, a, an episode of spin. They're just interested in trying to control the narrative. And the upsetting thing is that what they've been able to do or what they're, they're trying to do is to define World Cup infrastructure solely as stadia. Now, Qatar is a country of 2.3 million people, of which 350,000 only are Qatari nationals. That means that there are 1.95 million foreigners there. The vast majority of those are migrant labourers. And when we're talking about the World Cup in Qatar, we're talking about them, in some cases, building whole cities. So I think it's a reasonable claim to state that all construction infrastructure that's being prepared is done under the name of the World Cup. Without the World Cup, there would be considerably fewer people and considerably fewer infrastructure jobs. Now, I've been there and I've seen and I've, I've filmed uh, with hidden cameras the most appalling living conditions that you could possibly imagine. And this is, this is slavery in anyone's language that's, that's constructing what's going on. And to think that we've got the, the absolute jewel in the crown of world sport, the World Cup being built on the back of slavery, 
is disgusting and it's unacceptable and unfortunately Mr. Inf <clears throat> Mr. Infantino is doing very little about it. And Klaus, I assume you think the finger should not be pointed at FIFA for this. <laughs> the, uh, the case is totally different. I was in Nepal two years ago and I looked at these people going to the uh, airplanes and wanted to enter to fly for Qatar. They were happy to go to Qatar. They got about 200 US dollars a month in Nepal if they were well paid but they got 800 to 900 US dollars a month when they had the job in Qatar. So the Nepalese were very, very happy to fly from Nepal to Qatar to have a good work there. Now we know if we look from Western Europe, it's a different case, but you have to have the view from Asia, from Nepal, the, one of the poorest countries in the world. And the Nepalese wanted to work, they want to work in Qatar, and the, even the government wants them to work to get money back by billions from the Qataris. So, Jamie, it's a privilege for them. Andrea, Andrea it's a privilege let's be clear. For them, yes. Klaus has in their view, Klaus in their has, view Klaus it's a privilege. In our Western European view. Hold on, let, let me let Jamie finish. I, I think. Yeah, no, Andrew, let let's be see. clear. From Klaus has the spoken Western to these European, people before they've left. Before they've left. Hold, hold Klaus has spoken to these no, people before I've, they've left I've, Nepal. I've spoken to no, them after no. they've arrived in Qatar. And the living conditions are disgusting. They're horrendous. They can't change jobs. They have to submit their passports whilst they're there. We're talking about there was devastation from the Himalayan earthquakes. Uh, many, many um, Nepalese were refused permission to go back for funerals for their family members. This is a controlled construction program, which is slavery in anyone's language. And you've got to talk to them after they've been there, not before they're, when they're all excited to get on a plane and go. OK, Jamie and Klaus, so unfortunately we're out of time. Klaus, I'm sorry I couldn't get your final reply there. But I'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining us both on the Newsmakers. On the next edition of the Newsmakers, Chelsea Manning walks free. We ask whether the top secret information she leaked had any impact on the Iraq war. But for now, that's all for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'm Andrea Sankey. Goodbye.